This is CBC Here and Now. Basically, this was the first Western star um, that I had both the top picture, the top story, and the bottom story. A blow to local news on the West Coast. Staff at the Western Star are still coming to terms with the layoffs at the newspaper. I'm not the biggest guy, I still win battles in the corners, you know, and that's, that's my game. I can make plays out of the corners. Meet the Russian teenage hockey star who's hoping to take the growlers all the way. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Anthony Germain. Now we'll have those stories just ahead, but we're going to start in southern Labrador. A difficult first year for the kayak. The ferry servicing the Strait of Belle Isle strands passengers and freight on both ends of the run. Our Jacob Barker is in Blanc Sablon to find out how people who rely on the ferry are coping. Here's a look at what he's found so far. The Kayak W isn't here. It's on the other side of the Strait of Belle Isle waiting as it has been many times this season for an icebreaker to come and help it get across. The water is clear here close to the dock, but you can see the ice a few kilometers out right now. The new ship has had a difficult inaugural season stuck on one side or another for days on end. While well, the government says it's the weather, some here are saying the kayak is the wrong boat for the job. Others are saying these are just kinks that need to be worked out and it's Hard to have a conversation with anyone here in town without the kayak coming up. In fact, a meeting that was held in Lance Alou Town Hall was standing room only yesterday. I'm here to speak to the people who live closest to the ship's dock to find out how the disruptions have been affecting their lives and livelihoods. I'm the eternal optimist, I guess, in, in the fact that, uh, you know, I think with uh, strong advocation on our part and a willingness to make something work on the government's and the contractor's part, then we'll get it done. On tomorrow's program, we'll hear more from him and others about what they think can be done with ferry service here in the Labrador Straits. So I hope you tune in for that. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Blanc Blanc. And as Jacob mentioned in his report, it was standing room only at last night's meeting in Lansalou. More than 150 people turned up to voice their concerns about the kayak. According to the mayor, the province bought the wrong vessel and the backup plan flying people to St. Anthony after five days of ferry delays isn't enough. You couldn't go to the grocery store for a long period of time to, to get the, the types of produce that you would need, like eggs, milk fresh vegetables, fresh meat. People are out hundreds, and in some cases thousands of dollars in travel bills and hotel bills and uh, restaurant bills when they've been stuck waiting on this vessel to move. And like I said, some people can't benefit from the floats because they just don't help them get to where they're trying to go. And Mayor Trent O'Brien also says the kayak isn't powerful enough for the ice conditions. More of our conversation coming up in about 20 minutes on Here and Now. A well-known Happy Valley Goose Bay man has been given 90 days house arrest for sexual assault. 51-year-old Valance Oliver pleaded guilty to the charge. It all stems from an incident in May of 2017. Now, Oliver is known in the community as a photographer and as Santa Claus in the town's annual Christmas parade. He's also held several government jobs, including communications manager for the Department of Labrador and Aboriginal Affairs. Oliver's lawyer said on the day of the assault, his client had been drinking heavily and that Oliver had a drinking problem at the time. Oliver is also facing an unrelated charge of possessing child pornography. Well, this was an unusual day for people in Corner Brook who like to sip their morning coffee while reading their daily newspaper. For the first time in over six decades, the Western Star has not published. The paper has been around since the early 1900s and has been a daily since the mid-50s. But now the owners at Saltwire Network have turned the publication into a free weekly. The result is more than two dozen layoffs, according to the union that represents the workers. We're very, um, you know, a lot of us have been doing this so long and we, we, we enjoy it. We, we enjoy part being part of the media and doing that local part to, to our city. And um, it's, it's a little bit of a feeling almost like you lost your best friend, I think. And more of our conversation with Muriel Grant Dumphy in about 25 minutes. <laughs>
little bit of a brisk day out there today. We saw temperatures sitting above zero for the most part for the island, uh, even up through Labrador as well. Happy Valley Goose Bay reached a high near one degree. Now it was brisk as I mentioned, so factor in that wind chill, feeling closer to the minus single digits. And as we head through the night tonight, the flurries and all of that uh, accompanying this low pressure system that's slowly trying to make its way out of the way is going to end through the overnight, giving way to a pretty beautiful afternoon tomorrow. I'll have all those details because the next weather maker looks like it's coming as we head towards it or in least the middle of next week. I'll have all those details coming up. Anthony. Thanks, Ashley. Artists say cultural programming wouldn't exist in this province without Arts NL, and that's why they're pushing for more government funding. Now, there's been social media posts as well as a letter writing campaign, and today, artists decided to take to the House of Assembly. Here now is Katie Breen was there. So, Katie, what do the artists want? Well, they want more money to create more art. Right now, Arts and L gets about $2 million a year, but artists are asking government to increase that funding to $5 million by 2021. Here's some of what happened at the House of Assembly today around all of that. Mr. Speaker, Rick Mercer wrote, It is thanks to early support from Arts NL and groups supported by Arts NL that I owe my career. Petrina Bromley, Newfoundland actor and come from away on Broadway, wrote, I would never have become a professional actor if I hadn't been hired to act. We see the value in the arts. This is why we have such a strong cultural community here. It is because of all the individuals that are involved. We work in partnership. We work with Arts NL, government as well. Any investment in Arts NL will come in budget 2019. That budget's coming Tuesday. Doesn't look like artists are going to get a clear answer before then, but they were at the Confederation Building today, listening in. As for what Mr. and Minister Mitchell Moore said, we're hopeful. We're still hopeful. There has been no sign of a no yet. And um, so he said we would, uh, we would uh, probably find out on Tuesday during the budget. So we're all very hopeful and we'll be listening with ears to the ground. Of course, she won't be the only one. Lots of organizations will be listening Tuesday for their funding because although this is an election year, the province is still in massive debt. Live from the newsroom, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. We can't blame the artists for having their hands out too. All week, the government has been making announcements. The latest this morning, $3.5 million to expand the Holy Rood Marine Base. And as you can see, that spending is adding up. Our latest tally puts it at $337 million in spending. That's uh, uh, announcement totals when you factor in the prison, which is a multi-year project. Now, I should just sort of, if you don't think there's an election coming, just uh, have a look at the front page of uh, today's uh, telegram. Mm -hmm. There's a little ad here. Yes, that's right. People making signs are already trying to get in on the election action. No bigger sign of an election than when sign makers are advertising, not just for parties, but for the election signs themselves. Yes, uh, the Elections NL website also has a posting saying it's ramping up for the election by putting logistics in place in all 40 districts. Well, lots of politicians getting themselves in the news. We know the government is announcing the budget on Tuesday, but we don't know if the legislature will actually debate and pass that budget or whether the premier will call an election and send us all to the polls. And it's a question that PC leader Chess Crosby was trying to get an answer for today in the House. Is the Premier's intention to debate the budget or will he throw us into an election with no budget debate? Mr. Speaker, we have taken this province a long way in the last three and a half years. And I look forward to the debate, whether it's at the doorsteps or here in this House of Assembly. So will there be, will there be Will there be a budget debate? Mr. Speaker, there's always a budget debate. You can't get a budget without having a budget debate, I say, Mr. Speaker. But I will guarantee you this. The financial picture of our province that we will put to the people up in this province when we're ready for the debate will be better than the financial picture that you've missed the opportunity for your own party. You couldn't even get the financial picture of the PC party right, Mr. Speaker. That's quite a bombastic answer to a very indeed. simple question. Will there be a budget debate? Mr. Speaker, the people of this province, including the leader of the opposition, including the leader of the third party, have all been calling for an election. They've been asking for an election, Mr. Speaker. This province is turn being turned around by the work of this government, and we're prepared to have that debate with anybody, where, anywhere. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> the Premier, the <laughs> yeah, in fighting form, uh, I was watching that exchange today, so there's a real feeling that next week, 
It's going to be a big week in politics, so uh, some answers after the budget, I suspect. Yeah, absolutely. Stay tuned next week. All right, the Newfoundland Growlers are kicking off their playoffs. We'll get to games of a different sort, and this push, of course, is tomorrow night. And their offense is getting a last-minute boost from a highly touted prospect. Here now is Garrett Barry introduces you now to number 19, the youngest player to skate in the ECHL. Meet the newest and youngest growler. All the way from Russia. Salmon Daragachinta. But you can call him SDA. Yeah, that's my nickname in hockey. And that's because your full name is a bit of a mouthful for these guys, yeah. is it? Yeah, I like it. So. He's getting to know us, too. I think it's actually a good talent, you know. Uh, especially try to go to like seafood restaurants, try a lot of uh, fish and everything. Yeah, so. And what a year he's had. Drafted by the Leafs and signed a pro contract. Johnson and scores, jamming it in through the lens. But 46 points in junior, not enough. Like stats wise, I didn't have the year that I wanted to. I didn't like put up the really big numbers. So he's calling this a new start. I actually do feel way better. Like I feel like I'm playing my game here. He's also calling for a ride. Uh, I know there's a Russian taxi driver here. Right? Yeah, so. Is that right? Have you have you spoken to him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always get a raise from him, and um, he actually worked here a long time ago. Even when uh, like the guys like Markov, like Antropov, play here, he all know them. So, it's uh, pretty funny. His teammates call him SDA because his full name, well, they haven't quite mastered it yet. But the Growlers are not short on praise for the 18-year-old player. You know, I think about when I was 18, I was nowhere near that at that level. So, uh, really good player. He's, he's got he's got a lot of hockey sense. Uh, he sees the ice really well. He's got uh, as advertised when it comes to his awareness with the puck and making plays to space and stuff. So, I think he's been good in his first three games. I think he's only going to get better. They think he can make an impact in this first round series. All he's got to do is, you guessed it. Honestly, I just uh, like I said, I stick to my game plan. I just do what I do on the ice. Garrett Barry, CBC News, St. John's. Inside the building, there's some um, 25 employees that were, were that were um, sent home yesterday. From a daily to a weekly. People in Cornerbrook woke up to coffee, but no newspaper today as the Western Star has stopped publishing every day. What that means for those employees in about 20 minutes.
This weather update is brought to you by the Healthcare Foundation Home Lottery. Order your tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. Well, before we get to the weather, we had a bit of a fun morning out to uh, Villanova Junior High School mm -hmm. out uh, in CBS. Just have a look at this. It's Literacy Day, and you're watching here and now. Hi, Mom. 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 That's Ms. Swain's grade six class. It was Literacy Day out there. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and yeah, yeah, and I also went, uh, I was in the grade five class. This is then there of Miss Fleet's class. We had such a great time. Who's the big kid in the back? Oh, that's you. That's okay. me. Yeah. <laughs> that's me in the back. It was so great talking. I just love going to the schools and, and uh, them asking me questions about, you know. Do they always ask about uh, like weather disasters and stuff like that? Yeah. Or yeah. Like hurricanes, well, tornadoes, yeah. floods? I didn't get a lot of those questions this time, but uh, most of the time that's exactly what I get. Yeah. yeah. And, and they asked me all about my bees. That was uh, my big conversation. Uh, of course. <laughs> Start them young. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they were quite curious about the bees, and I'm Excellent. always happy to talk about it, so. Yes, yes she is. <laughs> Absolutely. <Anywho. laughs> uh, so, getting close to the weekend, tomorrow's yeah. Friday. Mm -hmm. How's it looking? Well, I don't want to give it away. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> That means it's going to be beautiful. Uh, yeah, no, tomorrow looks uh, lovely, but earlier today, you know, temperatures were below seasonal, so we're, we're not exactly, cool. you know, close to spring, or at least we are in spring, but it doesn't feel like it. So we take a look at the current temperatures, uh, sitting between zero and four degrees across most of the island, and then up through Labrador, similar temperatures. Now, if you want to know where spring is, and you feel like uh, it's somewhere over the other part of Canada, it's not. Uh, it's cold pretty much everywhere right now. We're hanging on to these cooler temperatures below seasonal. Around here, we should be sitting in the uh, mid-single digits, close to seven or eight degrees even in some cases, but uh, that's certainly not the case. And we do have that low pressure system that I've been talking about since Monday, uh, just swirling off the coast right now. It is starting to finally pull away and that means we are going to see some clearing skies as we head through the night tonight. So here's a look at the satellite radar. You can see just some scattered activity happening. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see that as we head through the night tonight as well. Generally along the northeast coast, some scattered along the west coast as well. The Avalon could see uh, a few flurries. Otherwise, Labrador, where it's been pretty stormy for the past uh, week or so, or at least through this week, we are starting to see those warnings drop off and things will clear out. So here's a look at uh, the blowing snow advisory. Now the winter storm warning has changed to a blowing snow advisory. Anticipate that this will end as we head through the overnight tonight. And those temperatures will be sitting in the minus single digits essentially uh, across the board. Minus two in Port of Basque with clear skies. Again, some lingering flurry activity for the west coast, northeast coast, and the Avalon as well with some northwesterly winds gusting upwards of about 60 kilometers per hour. Those winds easing yet again along the west coast up through Labrador, dipping down to minus 19 tonight for Lab City. Things should clear out. That's why we're going to see these cooler temperatures. Happy Valley Goose Bay minus 11. Cartwright hanging on to the chance of a few flurries to start and then clearing skies there as well. Uh, and then towards tomorrow, not a whole lot happening. Uh, plenty of sunshine, it looks like, right across the board. Now, we will start to see some flurry, or we will see some flurries in the first half of the day, at least for the metro area, uh, starting as some scattered flurries, minus one as you uh, go out the door this morning, or tomorrow morning. Afternoon should clear out nicely. Three degrees will be your afternoon high, and then as we head towards the evening hours, those clear skies should stick around, but it'll be breezy, hovering uh, with between 40 and 50 kilometer per hour gusts and the zero degree mark. Otherwise, across the uh, island, we are looking at plenty of sunshine between two to four degrees. Again, those winds sticking around. Uh, five for Grand Falls, Windsor. Some flurries possible in the first half of the day for Gander as well and plus two. Uh, between zero and two degrees along the west coast as well and then up through uh, the northern peninsula. We're looking at plenty of sunshine and that's the story essentially right through Labrador as well sitting between one to three degrees, a little bit cooler towards uh, Labrador City at minus one tomorrow. Now looking ahead, the weekend, not a whole lot happening. It does look a little bit unsettled, but the main system that I'm keeping my eye on will move in midweek, but I will have all those details when I come back.
I want to say I'm sorry to you, our viewers, about a poor choice of words that I made last night. For weeks, I've been trying to get this story about dementia villages on here and now. It's a very important topic, and during that interview, I said something that I regret. So for somebody who is actually not afflicted by the disease, it might sound kind of like an, odd, an oddity that a village would have people wandering around, but this is not sort of zombies just left on their own, right? I mean, they're, they're supervised. Give me a sense of how they work. Now, what I was doing, I was trying to make clear that people with declining mental abilities were not going to be left alone within the walls of these villages, and it was a bad metaphor, and I'm sincerely sorry. And by the way, nobody at the CBC has instructed me to say this. Onward. Well, there is plenty of frustration for people relying on the ferry service in the Strait of Belle Isle this year. The new ferry, Kayak W, has been no match for the dense ice clogging the strait, and that has left people and freight stranded time and time again. Last night, a public meeting was held in Lansalou to try to tackle the problem. The town's mayor, Trent O'Brien, was there, and he joins me now. So, Mayor O'Brien, what was the turnout like last night? Well, we had uh, more than 150 people uh, show up to the meeting. We went through the technical specs of this vessel. Uh, we went through its original concept of design that was posted by the original manufacturer. Um, we went through its horsepower, uh, the blueprint for the ship. Uh, we talked a lot about, of course, the missed crossings this winter due to the, uh, the low horsepower of the ship. Um, the potential for missed crossings this summer and due to the low speed of the ship. So what's the sense about this ferry, the Kayak W? Do the people up there think that this was the right ferry, the right choice for the area? No, um, people believe, and rightfully so, that there's absolutely nothing correct about this vessel for this run. It, it's not that the vessel itself is not a nice ship or not a good ship for somewhere else, but it's ill-suited for the run here in the Strait of Belle Isle. Uh, we have ice conditions on an annual basis. Yes, this year might be uh, maybe a little bit worse than some years, but ice is part and parcel of living here. Uh, government has known this. There's been ice in the Strait of Belle Isle since there's been a Strait of Belle Isle. And when selecting a ferry for a year-round service, that should have been considered a lot more closely. Well, the hope of the committee is that uh, there will be some room within the contract that was signed with the operator to maybe secure an, a, a different vessel uh, for this run. That's the, the ultimate goal because, I mean, other than that, we've got this thing for 12 years and government was warned against this before it was even put on here. In the short term, uh, to deal with missed crossings, well, it's a two-fold issue because we have uh, moving passengers and then we have the other issue of moving freight. Of course, you can move passengers uh, by airplane, and the government has been doing so to Sanathony, but only after five consecutive days of missed crossings. Uh, and once you're in Sanathony, you're still an hour from the town of Sanathony or an hour from St. Barb, and you don't have access to your vehicle. Uh, rental cars are scarce over in that area. Uh, shuttle services to the uh, through the west coast and into central are, are harder to access. So even if government pays for flights back and forth to St. Anthony Airport, which they've been doing, it still doesn't help the vast majority of people who are traveling. Now, we also have the freight issue. Um, the government subsidized some freight to move around this year, mostly grocery, or grocery items or what they have deemed uh, essential services. Uh, but for businesses like mine, who I'm in autom I work in automotive and uh, sell vehicles, and for snowmobile dealers and repair other repair places for hardware stores, we haven't been extended the opportunity to have our freight moved by subsidy or on either one of the trips that the ice breakers did when they were transporting. Them. What kind of stories are you hearing from residents there? Uh, what are they saying about how this is affecting their lives? It's, it's affecting people greatly. I mean, you couldn't go to the grocery store for a long period of time to, to get the, the types of produce that you would need, like eggs, milk, fresh vegetables, fresh meat. Um, I know of customers who had their vehicles stuck in St. Barb for three weeks. Uh, you know, medical appointments have been canceled and rescheduled time and time again. People are owed hundreds, and in some cases thousands of dollars in travel bills and hotel bills and 
uh, restaurant bills when they've been stuck waiting on this vessel to move. All right, well, we'll be keeping an eye on the situation for sure. Mayor Trent O'Brien, thank you so much for speaking with me. Thanks for having me. donate books to the library all the time and if they're particularly unusual or rare they'll end up in special collections. Still to come we give you a peek inside the old rare and sometimes strange world of Munn's special books. Who knew that library shelves at Munn hold some journals that were written seven centuries ago? Well, this is a bit of a strange day for many people in Corner Brook. It's the first time in as long as anyone can remember that the Western Star newspaper hasn't published. That's because the Saltwire Company, the owner of the paper, has changed it from being a daily paper to a weekly. The switch means a lot of people are going out the door. Muriel Grant Dumpy has worked at the paper since 2002. She's the chief steward for the union that represents the workers, and she joins me now from Corner Brook. So this seems like quite an emotional day for you today. Yeah, um, sure is, Carolyn. The Western Star started publishing as a weekly paper, went as a daily paper in 1953, and up until today, April 11th, this was the first time the Western Star has now published. 
So how are you and your coworkers feeling about this? Um, we're very, um, you know, a lot of us have been doing this so long and we, we, we enjoy it. We, we enjoy part being part of the media and doing that local part to, to our city. And um, it's, it's a little bit of a feeling, almost like you lost your best friend, I think. And how many people are affected by this? Um, inside the building, there's um, 25 employees that were um, sent home yesterday, uh, 14 full-time employees and 11 part-time employees. On the outside, we're, we're kind of thinking probably around 20 people, which would be our contract drivers and our, our, you know, our kid carriers and such. 17 years is a long time, and I understand there were people there who, who were working there even longer. Well, yes, that's for sure. Um, I'm uh, other than a few people. I'm kind of on the on the uh, lower end of it. We're more in the middle of the seniority list. Um, our so most senior uh, em employee was uh, was let go yesterday, and she's marking forty three years. Wow, forty three. And, and the next one to her, he uh, also uh, was let go yesterday. He's just he's just um, recognized his fortieth year. And, you know, more than two dozen jobs lost uh, in this. How do you think this will be felt in the community as a whole? Well, I mean, it hasn't been a very long time. It's only been, you know, 27, 28 hours. And uh, the, the feedback from the, from the public and the community were very, very touched. Um, and um, they're not really taking very well to the news. Mm -hmm. There was no, um, unfortunately, I guess that's how businesses work things when they do this sort of thing but there was no notification to the public at all. So a lot of people did get up this morning believing that their papers were gonna be delivered. And from what I was told today, some of our contract drivers um, were under the same impression. Mm -hmm. What's next for you now? Well, I mean, it's it's still very you know early into it. Um, um, as with any kind of a, a union closure or a union restructure, um, there might be some bumping some people choosing to exercise their bumping rights in the next couple of weeks and so. Uh, so actually, you know, we've just kind of, as a, a group, we're a, sm a small group as, as a staff really anyway, and we just kind of decided we're gonna take a day or two to kind of reflect, think things through, and you know, do our, our due diligence on behalf of the union, and uh, see, you know, see what we can do to best suit, suit our members. Well, good luck to you going forward, and thank you so much for speaking with us. I really appreciate it and thank you very much. And Carolyn, I really would just like to say, I want to say thank you to our loyal readers on the West Coast and other places. And we, we do reach all around the world. So we want to thank you very much for supporting us all these years. Thank you. That's Muriel Dumphy, a longtime employee of the Western Star in Cornerbrook. Sad to see uh, local newspapers struggling. I'm going to stay with a story about reading right now. The large library at Memorial University is home to some very old, and I mean old, kinds of books and publications and very rare books. So ancient, in fact, that they have to be kept in special rooms under lock and key. Our Jeremy Eaton got a chance to uh, take a look at this collection up close. These are just somewhat rarer books than the ones that are on the shelves. But uh, I keep most of our really, really old material in here. Well, special collections is a catch-all term, if you like, for a whole range of different collections that are usually kept um, distinct from the circulating collections, meaning you can't go in and take the books off the shelves yourself. They're kept under enclosed stacks, and in order to see them, you have to request them to a reading room and then view them in a reading room. So this one was made in Bruges uh, around 1500, and it's a series of prayers. The book's divided into different sections. It begins with a calendar. So we have what we call our general rare books collection, which has been amassing since 1925, since Memorial College days. And that's about 12,000 books. As you can imagine, they just come through the door. So it's a piece of everything from the late medieval right up to the present. All kinds of unusual things in there. This one is dated at 1354. There's another one in here dated from 1311. So basically, these are legal documents of different kinds. Um, we just purchased these this year, so there hasn't been much work done on them yet. So you don't really know what, it's, what it says? Or? We have to get somebody to translate them because it's not only, mostly they're in Latin and French. Uh, these are French charters, but uh, 
you know, we need somebody who's versed in medieval Latin <laughs> and medieval French. We have a growing collection of artist books. Artist books are a kind of um, 20th century experimental book form uh, that have kind of one leg in the book arts and one leg in the arts world. And really they're the kind of only, uh, up until the advent of the electronic book, they were the, probably the only new addition to the book world in the 20th century. Um, so we have a growing collection of those of about 400. Hi, my name is John Lennon. I'd like you to meet Yoko Ono. So her book is a little book of instructions, if you like, to do all kinds of weird and wonderful things out in the world. And it's kind of very tongue-in-cheek, funny, you know, very 60s, right? So this is a full version of the King James Bible for the 19th century. It comes with its own little box. Oh, so it's even smaller. It's even smaller. So it comes in this protective box. And if your eyes are good enough, you can actually read the text. So we often tell them about these collections, but unless they have a specific need at the time, it kind of goes in one ear and not the other. Unless they have a private interest that they want to explore. Um, but when you do see it is when they have courses designed around book history and, and illustration and those kinds of things, and then students are kind of blown away by what's available to them in the physical form. I mean, I see it all the time. You put a, a medieval manuscript in front of a student and their eyes light up in a way that you don't see when they're just sitting in front of a screen, right? They didn't cut corners. They used the resources that they had at the time to do the job so that they ended up with a safe boat. Uh, because remember, there's five-eighths of an inch between you and the water, so it's got to be built right. Boat Building 101. Some students in St. John's get a modern day lesson on how to build the dories of the past. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, some social studies students in St. John's rolled up their sleeves this week. They're getting hands-on to learn an old skill from our province's history. Cease Hare has this report from Beaconsfield Junior High. Instead of books and pencils in the classroom, this grade 8 social studies class was boat building in the library. More specifically, punt building and dory building. So when you take a look at this boat here, 
you're looking at a solid wood model with a saw cut. Master boat builder Jerome Canning and his experts from the Wooden Boat Museum in Winterton set up the workshop. He says it's a learning experience for many of them. Some have never handled, had a hammer in their hand or held a nail and then hit it with the hammer. Some may never have a measuring tape. Students get hands-on basic boat building design and construction techniques. Gentle sweep from right to left. That's the idea. Planing the wood so that planks on a dory are flush. Spiling the planks, shaping them. Instruction on rib making and design, framing and putting it together, using model boats to scale. I like the first table because it's like the beginning steps kind of and then you can see how far along it goes. How um, hard it was to be a fisherman, you know, going out in dangerous waters and a lot of people lost their lives doing that. Line up the boat. Kids love it. It's, it's hands on. It's real life. It's not in a textbook like Justin said. It's, it's there. They don't even want to talk to you. They're too into it. Kids who, you know, in classroom might not thrive and then they come here and they get their hands dirty and they love it. The teachers admit their approach to social studies is unorthodox. Last week they were on a shrimp boat. Next month it's a day about boat safety. The teachers hope to expand this boat building idea and develop it into a larger learning experience to include math and a science component. CSAIR, CBC News, St. John's. It's a pretty noisy and active library. Yeah, that was really neat. Yeah, it's good to see kids learning by doing, too. An old right? trade, Having yes. a lot of fun, that's good. <laughs> in other news, a grandfather from Nunavut is stuck in Winnipeg because he can't get treatment near his home. The former politician blames Canada's fractured health care system, and as we hear from the CBC's Gillian Taylor, he wants the system fixed so that everyone has equal access to medical treatment. For the past three months, Peter Kutuk has stayed at the Kivalik Inuit Center. The 68-year-old has kidney failure, which can't be treated in Nunavut. In the beginning, I was, I was given choice. If I want to do home dialy uh, uh, dialysis, I said, yes, I, I, I want to do that. Kutuk's home is Sani Kilowak, Nunavut's most southern community. It's located on an island in Hudson Bay. And with less than a thousand people, the community is served by a nursing station. For more serious medical needs, they're flowing to Winnipeg. And since January, Kutuk gets dialysis three times a week at the Health Sciences Center. It's better to be home instead of uh, laying down on the bed uh, almost all day. If he was a Manitoban and with the right training and equipment, home dialysis could be an option. The problem is, Kutuk doesn't even know if he's a candidate. His assessment was cancelled six weeks ago without reason. It hasn't been rescheduled. They wanted to give me a Manitoba health card, but I, I refused. No, I, I, I'm not going to take your health card. Uh, I'll have my no health card because I want to be home. There is no formal agreement between Manitoba and the territory, but patients can qualify for home dialysis, but only if Nunavut foots the bill, around 35000 for the first year alone. The Manitoba Renal Program says it has accommodated less than five Nunavut mute in the last three years. Katuk says he's written to Nunavut's health minister and hasn't heard back. Ironic, he says, having served as an MLA for 10 years. I know I'm... I have a right to be home, so I'm, I'm going to fight. It's not the first time Katuk has fought to go home. He was forced out for residential school as a child. I'm elder now. I still have to be separated from my family and uh, from my community. Uh, so it, it's not fair. With 10 grandchildren waiting on him, Katuk says staying here is no longer an option. Jillian Taylor, CBC News, Winnipeg. 
Now to some international news. Almost seven years after he took refuge in Ecuador's embassy in London, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange was dragged out of the building today by British police. It happened as Ecuador revoked his diplomatic status and the United States indicted him for conspiracy and called for his extradition. <sighs> Footage was shot by an agency owned by the Russian Today News Channel. Assange was taken directly to a London court where he was charged with skipping bail. A judge found him guilty on the spot. He called Assange a narcissist and said his claim of an unfair hearing years ago was laughable. The first extradition proceeding for Assange is set for May 2nd. A group of mothers has launched a class action lawsuit involving a Moncton hospital. It's alleged a nurse gave them all a labor-inducing drug without their permission, and that led to at least two emergency C-sections. Lawyers believe many other women may have had similar experiences. Jada Scott is the lead plaintiff in the case, and she gave birth to two twins last month. I didn't get to meet my girls right away. I was put unconscious, right? So. It's supposed to be an exciting moment, and that was robbed. Uh, the Moncton Hospital fired the nurse accused of giving the oxytocin last month. Nicole Ruiz's nursing license has been suspended pending the outcome of an RCMP investigation. None of the allegations have been proven in court. Okay, well, earlier in the show, you said you didn't want to give it away. <laughs> See, wait a second, why do we pay her? Because we want you to give it away. No, because that was very I, funny. Because I had to fill time with how beautiful it was going to be tomorrow. Yeah, That's excellent. why. Excellent. Good job. <laughs> And today's weather whiskey day. It right? is. It's already Thursday. Thursday. So we'll take a look at uh, who our next one is. And it's Madison Upshaw. Upshaw? Upshaw. Upshaw, sorry. I just was you got practicing. Right. You was got practicing. Right. <laughs> wow. Uh, so this is her super moon. She's wow. 11 years old from Bain Harbor. What and a great picture. It there, is. A beautiful great example of perspective, too, yes. with the uh, tree plants or whatever they are in front of the moon. Is that the moon or the sun, Ashley? That's Ashland? the moon. That's the moon. Okay. It's super the super moon. moon. 
Right. That's right. And there she is there. Nicely Aww. done. Yeah, great drawing. Thank you so much for sending that uh, wonderful super moon in. If you want to be part of our Weather Whiz Kid Club, send your drawing, your e or your uh, address, your name, and how old you are to nlphotos.cbc.ca, and yeah. we will get you on. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And you'll get a postcard. That's and you right. will. In the mail. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So looking ahead now, how is it... Uh, how does it break down? Yeah, so the beginning of the week, or beginning of the weekend rather, tomorrow, mm -hmm. lovely. A mm, little bit unsettled as we head uh, for the rest of the week, but not too bad, at least the rest of the weekend. So we'll start to see some cloud cover move in through the night on sat uh, Friday night into Saturday morning. And then the next system rolls in. Now you saw that move very quickly across your screen and it has lots of energy and then peters out by the time it makes it to uh, Newfoundland for the most part. So that's good news, but it, it will still be a little bit unsettled. So we'll see, still see a mix of sun and cloud for most of the island with that chance of um, a little bit of a wintry mix, maybe some freezing rain to start, and then either rain or snow through the afternoon. But again, not shouldn't amount to too much. Labrador looking at the potential for flurries, but we are starting to see some warmer air push in with that, so we could see a mix of uh, some drizzle potentially even by the by the time it gets there it'll likely just be drizzle for uh, western Labrador and then through the evening as you can see we're not going to see a whole bunch going on uh, just that slight risk of either rain or flurries through the afternoon so taking a look at the temperatures they're going to be sitting quite warm which is why uh, we'll start to see things change or start as rain and then potentially change over to flurries through the overnight so anywhere between five to seven degrees along the south coast though a little bit cooler We're going to tap into some of that colder air uh, two degrees for Marystown minus one for Port of Basque and then two degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay again looking at the potential for some flurries up through Nain mainly sunny you're going to miss this system and then uh, that chance for flurries as well for Lab City now looking ahead we're going to move that system or it's going to move out of the way uh, through the day on uh, Sunday and then things should clear out we might see some lingering cloud cover some unsettled activity as well for the uh, Avalon otherwise we're going to start to get uh, some clearer skies through the day on Monday then the next system rolls in this one again not a great agreement on what's actually going to happen depending on the track this could be a significant snow event for most of the island or it could be a transition from uh, rain to snow through freezing rain or ice pellets that's certainly uh, what this model is showing through the day on Tuesday or rather it's showing uh, mainly snow through the day on Tuesday, but any track northerly is where we're starting to get into that mixing or a changeover to rain altogether. It is still many days away, but still keep that in mind if you are uh, have any travel plans into the beginning of next week. So here's a look at uh, the forecast over the next five days, clearing skies tomorrow morning for St. John's in Eastern Newfoundland. And then northwesterly winds 30 gusting 50 uh, looking towards central. Uh, same thing. So eight degrees. Look at that right through Monday with a wintry mix into Tuesday. We're going to see similar forecast for Wednesday. Nothing super significant in your uh, in your five day except for Tuesday and then for eastern Labrador. Again, no significant snowfall as of now. Three degrees tomorrow above zero right through the beginning of next week. And then for western Labrador could see some snow on Saturday and then uh, sunshine by the time Monday rolls around. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo when I come back. Okay, well, when it comes to tires, spring is not a time to tread lightly. Oh, I didn't slip yet. Uh, tread. Uh, got, I meant to ask Ashley if it's too, when should I change the tires? Because it's always kind of a roulette thing in Newfoundland. Right. We'll get to that later. Yeah. Before question. the winter tires come off and get uh, that rubber replaced from a previous season, you got a big question, right? How worn? is too worn. Yeah, in our latest installment of Kelly the Mechanic, Kelly Denine dishes out advice for making sure your tires are road ready. There are only four things keeping you and your car on the road, and that's tires. So it's very important to make sure that your tires don't get to a level where they're unsafe. It's important to make sure that your tires don't go below 4 30 seconds of an inch. There's several ways that you can measure that. The first way to check to make sure that your tires are safe for the road is to look for the thread wear indicators. The thread wear indicators run between the threads. Here's one right here. When the thread of your tire is level with the thread wear indicator, it means it's time for replacement. The second way you can check for tires red dip is by buying a tire thread dip gauge. 
You can purchase these for a few dollars at any local automotive parts store or even at Walmart. To check the tire depths with this gauge, insert it in between the threads and push down until the black pieces are level with the tire. To read this gauge, locate the row of numbers that ends with 32 30 seconds on the top. You'll see that the silver lines up with the number 8 here, which means that there's 8 30 seconds of an inch remaining on these tires, making them about half used. If you don't have a tire thread depth gauge and you really just want to save some money, use a dime. The distance from the bottom of the dime to the top of the queen's head is exactly 4 30 seconds of an inch. Take your dime and lay it in your threads. Get down to eye level and as long as the queen's head is covered by the tire, you're still good to go. I wonder okay, how the that, queen would feel about that. Yeah, that, what a line. As long as the queen's head is covered by the tires. Handy information. Yeah, really. Well, here's a dark photo, but absolutely beautiful. I love the it colors. Is. This is a, a sunset. Oh, West Coast. Uh, you'll have to find out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, tell you where this, I'll tell you where this photo is taken. Not giving away back. anything tonight. <laughs>we go you have a fun event to tell us about yeah on the sure it's one of my favorite fundraising events that i get to MC, and it's happening over the weekend uh this is an event that's hosted by the terra nova grannies and it's to raise money for uh, african aids orphans a lot of them teenagers now since the aids epidemic scrabble tourney costs uh, 15 dollars for players of all levels so beginner intermediate and so-called experts uh saturday april 13th from 2 p.m to 5 and that's at the lantern which is 35 barnes road in st john's just behind the basilica hope to see you there I love the name Terra Nova Grannies. Yes, and um, good cookies, by the way. Oh, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's have a look at the picture. Yeah, let's Can't take a look at our weather photo of the day today. Beautiful. My in-laws are going to complain that I blew this. Oh, and you just uh, spoke about oh, this. Terra Nova. Oh, I, I can't wait for the <laughs> call from my aunt and uncle. <laughs> <laughs> Because you yeah. know, yeah, because oh, you know. Debbie. Exactly. Oh, and Debbie. Oh, yes. Debbie's going to be furious. <laughs> <laughs> you think she would have guessed it? Yes. She Probably. knows that place like the back of her hand. Hey. She's like planted traps and she's gone fishing there and she's That's done everything true. there. Mm -hmm. You're right. Well, this anyway. is another one of the beautiful, dramatic sunsets. 
it's that are uh, fossil. Yes, yeah, Steve mm -hmm. sent us that photo. Thank you so much for sending this weather photo in. If you have any that you'd like to share with us, we'd love to see them. Send them to nlphotos at yeah. cbc.ca. Mm -hmm. Terra Nova, great spot. Mm -hmm. Have you been out there at all Not yet? yet. You, your list is getting well, longer kind of and longer. Actually. Yeah. Yeah, not Terra Nova, but I've been that way. Right. Some traveling in your future this summer. Oh, there's so much. I've got a list already in my mm -hmm. phone. It's growing. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the real reason she asked for these pictures. I go, mm, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> got them, got them, don't got them, got them, got them, yeah. don't got them. Scouting out where I'm going to be Brilliant. this summer. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Can't believe it's Thursday. Tomorrow's yeah, Friday. It is. And the yeah. weather on Saturday is looking nice, at least go. for the St. John's area. That's right. It's B weather. That. <laughs> totally is. See you tomorrow. Good night. Good night.